1 Peter 2, 9 through 12, Peter writes, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among all Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's pray. Father, uh, I ask the Holy Spirit that you would come now and be the teacher and the enlightener of your word. I pray, Father, that you would take just what we need from these verses and implant them into our hearts. Cultivate them, Father, by your love and your spirit, that they would produce fruit in our lives, fruit in this church family, fruit that remains to your glory. For we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody says, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Did you know that it has been five weeks since we were last in the book of 1 Peter? I had to look that up. It was the last Sunday in February that we were in the book of 1 Peter. I guess with all the lead up to the Passion Week, uh, it just worked out that way. So as I reopened 1 Peter, I thought, oh my goodness, I need to review this for myself. Where were we, you know? You kind of lose the trend of where we're at and what, how Peter was teaching us through the word here, how the Holy Spirit was teaching us. So I had to get my heart and my thoughts back into this wonderful book with the burly fisherman. The burly fisherman from Galilee who is our teacher uh, through this letter. The fisherman that became a fisher of men. And we find ourselves so easily relating to Peter, don't we? We find ourselves, really, I'm finding myself just totally willing to learn from Peter. What did you see, Peter? What did you know? What changed you so remarkably, Peter? I want to know. I want to experience the same as Peter did. So our last session in 1 Peter, where we were focusing on, was cherishing Christ our cornerstone, using him as the marker for which way's up and which way's down and what's right and what's not in our lives, how to build something in our lives. It all cues off of him. It's all to be built on top of him. We actually now could move on to 1 Peter 2.13. But as I was reviewing, I just got so caught up I was captivated, if you will, by the word as I found something here so profound that it became my prayer for all of us. My prayer for us individually, my prayer corporately for this church family. And there's only two points that I want to pull out of uh, this teaching couple of sub points that go with it but two main points and they speak these two points touch on everything that the bible has to say <laughs> what do you think about that that's pretty profound isn't it the two things that the holy spirit has given to me speak to the whole of the church family they are life they are eternal life impacting and they're here and I'm specifically speaking of verses 11 and 12. 
which shows to us something that the whole earth should be concerned with, and sadly is not. In fact, the case is quite the opposite, as I believe we shall see. Here they are. Here's the two items. Let's just give them to us right off the bat. They are the salvation of the soul and the glory of God. That's them. That's it. The salvation of the soul and the glory of God. And so I want us here in this church family and individually, I'm telling you, if you will make this your main focus, please do. For Calvary Chapel here in Midway City, uh, for your homes, make this your main objective. Now, verse 11 says, we believers are sojourners and pilgrims in the world. And certainly one of the ways in which this description fits us is concerning the salvation of the soul and the glory of God. If the world was concerned with the salvation of the soul and the glory of God, as the old song goes, what a wonderful world this would be, amen? I mean, everything would look different if this world was concerned with the salvation of the soul and the glory of God. I can't think of a single thing that would not be different in this world if that were the major concern. Facebook would look different, wouldn't it? Twitter would sound different. The news would be different. The government would be different, for sure. The court system would be different. The jails would be different. Our schools would be different. The goal of business would be completely different. Google would be different. I'm telling you, I can't think of two more vital, pressing issues to everybody born on this planet than these two. And I can't think of two more issues that the world as tossed by the wayside and is really shows no concern for at all. I don't want you to think that I'm exaggerating. So let me give you a couple of points to show us I'm not exaggerating. First of all, look how Peter begins in verse 11. Peter says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now look, Peter wastes no words in his letter. Every word is there for a reason and a purpose. Every word that's there is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yet here's this big burly fisherman and he comes to you and he says, Beloved, I'm begging you. Now first he uses the word beloved. Beloved and begging, that's kind of interesting that those two go together. So I spent some time thinking about that. These words from, come from somebody who loves the church. These words come from somebody who loves all the people that are in the church. And so he calls us beloved. And that's not just Peter speaking. That's the Holy Spirit speaking. The Holy Spirit is calling you beloved. How does God feel about me? Well, he calls me beloved. How does God feel about you? Well, he calls you right here beloved. And then he turns on that. Oh, by the way. In the New Testament, how is it that God gets things done in the world? The Through the church. When God wants something done, he gets it done through the church. He set up an order in the church. This is how I want it done. All the teachings of the New Testament, the letters of Paul and John and Peter, are all saying, Here's how you do it, guys. And here's how God gets it done. He works through the church family. So you could say we are the best dysfunctional family going. <laughs> God intends to show his strength through our weakness. And to show his goodness by bestowing upon us 
big buckets of his mercy and grace. That's just how he does it. He seems to enjoy that. He seems to pick the unlikely, the unusual, the doesn't fit in. And then he just pours through that person or those people that he calls the church, his will and his way and his plan. That is how he works. Beloved, I beg you. So if somebody's begging me, there's something that, that gives it weight if I know that it's coming from a heart of somebody, God, who loves me. So the one who loves me looks me in the face or speaks to me through my ears and the word of God and he says, I am begging you. This is by an apostle and the word of God. As sojourners and pilgrims. Sojourners and pilgrims. Those are people that are, what, just passing through. <laughs> They're not, they have a light touch on everything, don't they? You're, just, you're going to be here for how long? Just a little bit? <laughs> I'm just here as long as God wants me here, and then off I go. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a sojourner here on earth. And then here it is. He says, abstain from fleshly lusts. What does that mean? <laughs> it means this simply, don't let your flesh run the show. Because if your flesh runs the show, it's going to do serious damage to your soul. Isn't that what's being said here? Don't let your flesh run the show. Don't let it make the dictates of your life. Why? Because that brings on an internal battle. A war, he says. Not where war means war. That is destructive to the human soul. And Peter says, I beg you, don't do that. This is the ultimate human danger. Again, I'm not exaggerating. This is the ultimate human danger. There are forces in this world that can and will bring down a soul. Literally. The human soul, the seat of the mind and the will and the emotions. Here's what Jesus had to say. Take it from the Savior. Mark chapter 8, 36 and 37. Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The most valuable of possessions that no other thing of value in the world can be compared to is your soul and if the soul is lost the person is lost whatever you can think of Fort Knox I think there's still some gold in there isn't there Maybe. <laughs> the Donald has it. <laughs> Whatever. How about the billions and billions of dollars worth of gold that's been pulled out of Alaska? It continues to be pulled. All, whatever your wildest dream can be, it is not enough to purchase a single solitary soul. And yet our culture seems to value all else above the human soul. It is popular, very popular in our culture, to indulge the flesh. Social media is chocked full of me first. And self-indulgence is the order of the day. And our schools now, our schools are gladly, happily, encouraging your children to experiment with their sexuality at earlier and earlier ages and it is going to be the coming ruin of many many souls that's reality and here is Peter saying 
Peter is saying this, stay a sojourner. Keep your pilgrim wits about you. Don't blend in with this culture. Don't become so earthbound that nobody thinks of you and heaven in the same sentence. Maintain a perspective then of the temporariness of the flesh and the fleshly appetites that cause internal war. Well, I think we Christians are far too concerned with fitting in with the culture, right? We don't want to look weird. We don't want anybody to think we're strange. And so we're willing to forfeit many times our belief in God and our expression of our belief in God because we don't want anybody to think that we're weird. So we value the appearances of the world. And I tell you that it's taken a bite from the wrong fruit. No difference between Adam and Eve and doing that today in this culture. So the soul is the great issue of the believer and the non-believer and the yet to become a believer. Because we are, us, we're the male men and women of the gospel. We are the ones who have a good news for the soul of humanity. For this generation, for your families, for this neighborhood, for your neighborhood, for your friends and co-workers. Jesus is alive and he alone can save souls. Isn't that our message? He is the giver of the greatest gift to humanity himself. That we might be forgiven of sin and enter into eternal relationship with God. Look now how this leads into the second great issue of our lives. I go so far as to say, if you'll take care of this, everything else will take care of itself. Do you like it when, when the Bible can whittle something down to something, make it very easy for us and not complicate? It's not complicated. But if you'll take care of this, everything else in your life will be taken care of. Look at verse 11. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God. That's it right there. Your conduct is a setup for other people to glorify God in the day of visitation. That's the second great issue, the glory of God. Our conduct, our keeping, our actions, and our words honorable. Pay attention to this. It's not to win points with God. Don't be good to try and win points with God. Don't be good to try and earn your salvation because nobody can earn salvation. It is a free gift. But once you have received that free gift, now have honorable conduct so that other people might see it and be led to, pointed to, give glory to God. You see, uh, salvation is a gift. It must be because we are all sinners. <laughs> So there's nobody here that's going to earn the prize of salvation. You're the one person that's won the prize of salvation. You imagine what it would be like in heaven if you could earn your salvation. I know how I got here. How did you make it? It must be a gift because we are sinners. We are incapable of making ourselves right before a holy God who is also a judge. Look, when you get to heaven, do you plan on meeting God the judge or do you plan on meeting God your father? <laughs> I don't want to meet God the judge. I have, that's, that should put the fear of God in everybody. So Jesus came to win us back to the father to pay the penalty of our sin. And what's our part? To believe. That's it. Believe. And in that belief, in that faith, knowing what God has done for us, we want to follow him 
and it becomes our desire to bring him glory because he is glorious. That's it. I, I'm not trying to earn or make up or, you know, <laughs> keep myself out of purgatory. There is no purgatory. Our conduct not our identification with the world, not our living to look like the culture around us. Our honorable conduct is in order to point people to the glory of God. On Wednesday night, we covered Psalm 113. Here's how Psalm 113 begins. Praise the Lord! Praise, O servants of the Lord! Praise the name of the Lord! Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I just, I just been, you know, like reminiscing since last Wednesday, you know, like a good meal you have someplace, you know, and then you just say, boy, that was so good. Man, I need to go back there. <laughs> The world certainly doesn't look like this, but it should. But have you considered, believer, that this is what you're to look like? Constantly giving glory to God. That's what you're to look like. You are kind of a foreshadowing of when Christ returns. Want to know what it's going to look like when Christ returns? Check out a believer who is continually praising God and giving glory to God. That's what it's going to look like all over the place. Nobody will have to say to anybody else, do you know the Lord? <laughs> Everybody knows the Lord. From the time you rise and shine until you lay your sweet, sleepy little head back on that pillow once again, your every action, your every word is meant to alert the world around you to the glory of God. You are to be the lights that direct the world's attention to the great glory of our God. And we should fear the war that can happen inside that is capable of damaging your soul and possibly, I think this is even worse, lowering the esteem that belongs to God. Oh, wait a minute. What are you saying there, Pastor? I am saying that one way or another, you're either going to add to the glory of God or you're going to diminish the glory of God by your honorable or dishonorable conduct. Does that make sense? So Peter, knowing the value of the soul and what Christ has done, Peter comes along and he goes, Beloved, I'm begging you. Watch out. Don't take this lightly. I'm begging you. Because it's going to have a direct effect upon the glory of God. So wait a minute, if I expand this, and if my whole life is meant to give glory to God, then why am I a loving husband? For the glory of God. Why do I forgive the guy who cut me off on the freeway? For the glory of God. See how that works? If you take care of this, everything else will right away begin to fall into line. Uh, what do you think of when you think of the glory of God? What does it mean? What, what does the glory of God mean? Let's get a little bit of help from Ezekiel. Ezekiel in Ezekiel 10.4 says the following. Then the Lord's glory arose from above the winged creatures and moved towards the temple's threshold. The temple was filled with the cloud and the courtyard was filled with the brightness of God's glory, he says. The word translated glory that Ezekiel uses here in the Hebrew is the word kabod. Isn't that a great word? I just like that. Kabod. Everybody say kabod with me. Kabod. It's, it's a heavy, isn't it? It, 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 it? In fact, the root word carries with it the meaning of heavy. 
the heaviness of God or the weightiness of God. Also from this word comes the meaning of rich or riches. Ancient Hebrew writings would refer to a rich person as heavy in wealth. They're kabod in wealth. Just like our saying today, that guy's really loaded. Don't we say that same thing? Say we get the same thing. There's a weightiness. There's a heaviness. So for the believer to bring glory to God would mean that you believe, you act upon, you speak with the recognition that everything about God is weighty in your life. Versus the world, completely different. What God does and what he says is as light as a feather to the world. It means nothing. It doesn't hold anything. And I would say then we need to check ourselves. How is the glory of God affecting you? Is he glorious in your speech and in your conduct? Why? So that you win points with God? We've already said that's not the reason for it. The reason for it is so that you become this tremendous, beautiful sign. This sign that's always pointing to God. Isn't he something? Isn't he glorious? Isn't he awesome? Look to Jesus. Count on him. Pray to him. Worship him. Direct your every thought to him. Have, what would this church, what would any church be like? What would any group of people be like who all of a sudden decided that the glory of God and how it is expressed and believed in in their lives was the great, they thought was the greatest value that you could ever have? How would that change people? You just, God, you know? Just, wow. You know? It, it would redirect my thoughts. It would redirect my actions. If I had that, if I held that my most important thing from the rising of the sun until the time that it goes down is to bring praise and glory to God. So how does this work? What does this look like? Here's how it works. Because we want to affect the world, right? Both for the salvation of the soul and for the glory of God. We want people to say, what's going on? So here's how it works. Peter says, look, they're going to make fun of you. There's, is there anything politically correct about saying everybody is doomed to hell apart from Christ? I mean, that's as far from politically correct as you can get, right? But is it true? Yeah, it sure is. So how does this work then? If I'm living and acting and speaking like that reality is in my life, then people through time will look at me and say, why isn't, why isn't he, why isn't she, you know, they don't seem to be hung up about money. They, that just doesn't seem to be, because it's so important to me, boy, I got to have the bigger, better, best than the, why isn't it, why isn't it earth shaking for that person to be all wrapped up in money? There must be something different about you. Why isn't this person striving through life like I am? <laughs> That's what the world says. What is wrong with you that you that you're not freaking out? I mean, there's a lot of things to freak freak out about. Weren't there? There were like three giant earthquakes in the last day in the last 24 hours in the world huge ones uh, over six and one was over seven <laughs> one was in Alaska right yeah uh, why don't you freak out about that well you see my Lord said that before he returned there would be a lot of earthquakes in diverse places and they would actually be increasing in, in their magnitude and in their frequency I'm excited about that. Jesus is coming back, you know. There's something about that person who can live like that with this weightiness of God in their lives that changes how you act. If you believe God's taking care of your needs, Philippians 4.19. I know a lot of you are familiar with this. 
Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And with that truth, with that believed in and lived in, you're free to bring glory to God in your honorable conduct and in your words. Peter's going to instruct us in the next chapter with this beautiful verse. 1 Peter 3.15. Instead, Peter says, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to give an answer. I was reading out of New Living Translation. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you, right? Well, what's your hope? Well, you know, I mean, the world could say, I have hope too. I hope I'm going to win the lotto. I hope I'm going to close 10 deals this month. I hope I'm going to get a raise. I, I hope, you know, <laughs> I hope she's going to say yes when I ask her to marry me. You know, whatever the, you know, I hope he doesn't ask me to marry her, the girl says. Whatever the hope is, you know. <laughs> but for the Christian, the hope is the absolute knowledge and expectation of coming good. Oh, I just got a flat tire. Wow, I wonder what God's going to do, how he's going to help me. I just lost my job. Wow, Lord, let's see how you're going to take care of me. I mean, either I believe or I don't, right? Lord, I just lost a loved one. Can you comfort me through this? Can you give me now the peace that passes understanding? And the world sees you live like that, and the world goes, what up? What up with you? How can you do that? How can you be like that? And you can say, it's not because I'm a strong person. It's not because I'm a smart person. It's not because I know whatever. It's all because of Jesus. I believe that he's going to come through for me. You see, throughout my whole life, he's always come through for me. I've been a rat, but he's been good. <laughs> I've been a loser, but Christ always wins for me. I'm not relying on my strength anymore. You see, if I was relying on my strength right now, I would be freaked out. You'd have to peel me off the ceiling. But I have a Savior who loves me. And if you really want to know, I have the best news possible. Salvation is a free gift. So I'm encouraging all of us to learn how to share the gospel, to know it, to recite the good news. This church family is dedicated to that end. So the two great issues of our lives and of the whole world, the two great issues of the universe, the two great issues that cannot be avoided, that everybody will face, are the salvation of the soul and the glory of God. Can you imagine standing before God the judge and trying to explain how you lived and why you made the choices you made living in the richest country that's ever existed? Well, what did you do? How did you live? I lived totally ignoring the salvation of the soul and the glory of God. There's no hope there. There's no answers there. That's only the reality of coming destruction. Jesus said there's nothing, there's nothing that you can give in exchange for a single soul except what? The blood of Christ. Some of us need, I believe even right now at this moment as we're going to partake of communion, to redirect our desires, to redirect our passions. Like some people say, you come to the Lord and you, well, okay, you have to become boring, you know. You don't have to become boring. There's some of us that have lots of passion in our lives, don't we? Now, here's the thing. You've used it wrong. 
you've used it wrongly. I, all I'm saying is take whatever nutty, crazy passion that you have for whatever you have it and just put it onto Jesus. Just redirect the passions of your life. Redirect that. Look, we got parents, grandparents, and great grandparents in this room right now. You can affect your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids by how you live, by your conduct, by your expressing to them in every way that you can possibly think of or are led by the Lord the value of their soul and the war and destruction that they can bring into their soul by living a meaningless life versus living for the glory of God. God deserves the glory in your life. And your soul will flourish on account of it. I know this to be true because the one who made you says so here. And he does not lie. Now notice quickly, I want to mention this again. I mentioned it before. The end of verse 12. Notice the end of verse 12. They may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. The more I've studied this, the more I've looked through this, I believe that God is making visitations all the time. God is making a visitation here and now through his word. That's where God comes along and says, I'm real. I love you. And I've got a plan for you. I'm right, I'm right here right now. I'm visiting you with this word right now. Now what will you do? What will your response be? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this morning. And I just been a beautiful morning. Once again, Lord, you, you've done that for us. And now, Lord, with communion sitting before us, I pray, Father, that you'd help us to prepare our hearts now to have communion with you. To enjoy our oneness with you, Lord. Bless, I pray, every heart here. Help us, Father, individually and as a church family to have the two great issues of our life to be the salvation of the soul and the glory of God. For all these things we pray in Jesus' wonderful name and everybody says. Amen. Let's have the ushers come forward.